I'm Greg Stone from Columbia University Medical Center and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation in New York. And we're here in what an hour ago was sunny Paris, France uh, at the Euro PCR meeting. Now the rain has come, but that's not going to stop us from having a great conversation. We're here to describe uh, how to use coronary CT and FFRCT to guide treatment decision making. And at EuroPCR just today, there were two late breaking trials that were presented, the Pacific and Syntax 3 trials. So we're going to be talking uh, over the next half an hour or so about the very exciting emergence of FFRCT technology and the new findings from Pacific and Syntax 3. And to uh, help me with this task, I've got three uh, uh, good friends and well-known people. Um, uh, first um, is Paul Knappen, who's a professor of medicine and interventional cardiologist from the VU Medical Center in Amsterdam. Then I have the ultimate professor of medicine uh, from Imperial College of London, Patrick Seroyds, who needs really no introduction. And then my good friend Campbell Rogers, who's the chief medical officer of HeartFlow. So I think this is going to be a great discussion. So Campbell, I'm going to turn it uh, over to you, and maybe you can give us a little bit of background in heart flow and computational FFRCT analysis. Thank you, Greg, very much. I thought we would start just by a brief explanation for people who may not be as familiar with the, those here today with FFRCT, what it is, where it comes from, and that we're really anxious and excited to have, have uh, Professor Knoppen and Professor Soroy's uh, take us through the data. Uh, so the heart flow analysis is a personalized cardiac test. It aids clinicians in identifying treatment pathways for patients in a very patient-specific fashion. Uh, the fundamental inputs are cardiac CT images, which are gathered according to standard technique, and that may be a topic for some of the later discussion. Uh, it provides high diagnostic performance versus other non-invasive tests. The images come to heart flow. We then return results, and we'll show an example of that in a second of FFRCT back to clinicians to then incorporate with other pieces of information to guide, does this patient need to go to the cath lab, uh, what's the right revascularization strategy, and so forth. Uh, we do have an extensive amount of clinical data, and much of it has been gathered in relatively straightforward, low-risk patients uh, coming in for evaluation of chest pain, uh, coming in for relatively straightforward coronary disease, and what's particularly exciting about these trials is they really broaden that, that, that experience pretty significantly. Uh, we have 200 plus peer-reviewed publications. We've looked at accuracy, we've done outcomes trials uh, beyond the scope of this discussion, but a pretty robust, but again, focused on relatively low to intermediate risk patients. Uh, the data we have speaks not only to clinical outcomes, but also to cath lab efficiency, to health economic outcomes, all of which are important in this day and age in the medical universe of how decision making is, is undertaken. Uh, what's going to show now is an example of how the data come back. And as you see animated here, it allows a clinician to rotate, point, and then uh, obtain FFRCT values anywhere in the coronary tree. You see an example here of a value of 0.65 being obtained in the LAD distal to what appears to be a stenosis, and then essentially a virtual pullback can be done, just as would be done in the cath lab with a wire. So above that stenosis in the LED, now lo and behold, the FFRCT is 0.87. Uh, and that's how it comes back to clinicians, and that again is simply quantitative input, which allows clinicians to then say, okay, the best management for this particular patient and his or her lesions is the following. So this is really great. So it's a, um, uh, this is really a unique test, because first of all, it's non-invasive, uh, and it gives you information on both anatomy and physiology. So I think it's pretty novel in that regard. Um, it's, it's pretty extraordinary technology. Maybe you can go into just a, a minute about the uh, um, algorithms and the processing sure. that it takes to develop these types of images, and how does that work in the workflow of patient care? Yeah, sure. So the workflow first, so patients come in, they have a cardiac CT done, again, according to standard practices. Data come to heart flow, and at heart flow, what we do is a process which has been developed over years of incredibly sophisticated image segmentation to get very high fidelity images of the corner, segmentation of the corners, and then applying uh, algorithms and the principles of computational fluid dynamics, which say, if I know the anatomy to a really high degree of fidelity, and I know certain truths about coronary flow, myocardial mass, determinants of flow, and predictability of hyperemia, we then take all of those together and using fairly sophisticated computing algorithms, say, okay, based on that, across the corners, we can tell what is the pressure and therefore what is the FFR value at any point in the corners. That process 
comes back to the clinician. At present, it comes back with a turnaround time of under five hours, and we have some particular uh, setups with emergency room applications where it's actually coming back in well under two hours. Again, it's a it's a beautiful system because it allows you, you know, in the relaxing time of day to be able to look at this on first a web-based application, and I know you're moving this to either an iPad or iPhone-based application, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, so you can you can look at the entire coronary tree. You can see where their severe stenoses are. You can interrogate them. Um, you can going into a cath have the consideration of what might be best for that patient: PCI versus surgery, or maybe even medical therapy. But it gives you a lot of uh, of relaxation that you don't have to do it when you're there scrubbed in the cath lab making those real time decisions. Yeah, it does that, and it also relieves the cath lab of patients who go based on, let's say, a positive non-invasive test only to find that they have no obstructive coronary disease, right. which you know is, is a half of patients for stable chest pain patients. So we'll come back and describe some of the future studies that are going to be done, but I think uh, you know, what's impressive is that you've been building up an increasing series of, uh, of experiments, uh, both first comparative to FFR, now to other non-invasive tests, which Paul is going to describe, and then outcome studies uh, with platform and promise, and we've learned a lot about CT and FFR-CT and all these studies, and now pretty soon we'll be starting large-scale randomized trials to really insert it into the everyday workforce. Well, that's a great introduction. So uh, um, uh, Paul uh, Knappen presented the Pacific trial, which has been an extension of prior work that he's been doing, looking at comparative outcomes data. So Paul, with no further ado, why don't you tell us about your late-breaking trial? Okay. Um, so the Pacific was a head-to-head -head comparison trial of uh, PET with SPAC with CTCA. And this is a sub-study of that Pacific trial where we now um, um, had FFRCT of all the CTCAs that we have. And, and the Pacific was uh, published last year in JAMA Cardiology, and uh, now we've done this sub-analysis which we uh, presented here. So by way of background, we've been um, telling this, um, you can do non-invasive imaging on patients with suspected coronary artery disease either on an anatomical level with CT coronary angiography or a functional test, um, either myocardial fusion imaging predominantly with PET or with SPECT. However, we now have the possibility when we, when we combine CT coronary angiography with the FFR technology that we combine both an, uh, the, uh, uh, the anatomical features and physiological features into one test. Um, so this is not new. We've known uh, from uh, the Discover Flow trial, the Defecto trial, and the most recent, uh, the NXT trial, that FFR CT adds incremental value over uh, CTCA uh, solo um, in terms of uh, diagnostic accuracy to diagnose obstructive coronary artery disease. However, what's lacking is that none of these trials have tested it in, against um, um, the, the other non-invasive tests that we routinely use, predominantly SPEC, but in modern day and age also much more uh, PET. Um, so the aim of this study was to compare FFRCT against the traditional non-invasive imaging tools with nuclear cardiology being SPEC and with PET. And, um, uh, this is in a head-to-head -head fashion. So this is actually the first trial. Now, each single patient underwent a series of tests and were all referred to the cat lab where they all had routine fractional fall reserve of each and every artery regardless of having a stenosis, yes or no. So a very comprehensive database of 208 uh, patients, again, with a series of tests and now in a retrospective manner uh, uh, doing the FFRCT on the CTCA. Um, all the scans were sent to blinded core labs all across the globe um, and, and uh, none of the operators in the cat lab had any prior knowledge of the imaging and none of the imaging had any, any uh, influence on whether a patient was sent to the cat lab. Um, so um, these are the patients. There were 180 patients that out of the 208 that we were able to obtain an FFRCT value. Um, predominantly uh, male with a uh, age of close to 60 with the uh, usual cardiovascular risk profile and the distribution of typical and atypical um, chest pain. So this is pretty, pretty much what the protocol looked like. We see an image of a CT coronary angiography with a plaque and circumflex. We see a spec image with ischemia. We see a PET image with ischemia. And we see an FFRCT value, which displays the, the fractional flow reserve, in this case, in a circumflex of 0.64, which coincided with 0.53, uh, which was measured in, in the cat lab. So these are all concordant results. Obviously, not every, uh, everybody in the trial had concordant results. And that's exactly what the trial was testing. So, um, 
In general, it's good to state that about 83% of vessels uh, were able to, to derive FFRCT. So it's a very important to state that 17 percent of vessels could not be analyzed by FFRCT and this is predominantly happening in the right coronary artery predominantly due to the motion artifacts which occur more frequently in the right coronary artery as opposed to the LED in the circumflex. And was uh, that despite on despite beta blocker slow yeah, down? So the protocol was was tight so um, obviously pre pre treatment with a beta blocker in case of uh, heart rate uh, above 65 only patients in clear stable sinus rhythm and um, if if heart rate was still above 65, we can ad administer additional uh, beta blocker uh, prior to the scan. And if patients did not reach the target heart rate, we redo the scan on a uh, separate occasion. However, sometimes you see that during the contrast injection, even though they're stable at a low heart rate about 60, then they fly up to 70 or 71, right. and those are in the trial also. Okay. So this is one of the key drivers of image quality. It wasn't as much as calcium that, that okay. came back negative on really FRCT. Right. It's really so the we'll heart rate and image quality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, this is the correlation between invasive FFR and FFRCT. It's pretty good um, with an error value of 0.88. And uh, there was some bias in the blunt outman in terms of there's sort of underestimation of FFRCT. So generally yielding a lower FFRCT as opposed to the invasive FFR. Sort of probably because hard flow wants to stay on the safe side. I assume the algorithm is, is built that way. Um, so these are the results. Uh, what you can see is this is on a per vessel analysis of the 83% of vessels that we could analyze out of the 208 patients that FFRCT displays the highest diagnostic accuracy with relatively well balanced sensitivity and specificity, uh, which was higher than the non-invasive imaging with either SPECT uh, or with PET or with, uh, or with CT as a standalone uh, test. So these are uh, the C statistics uh, stating again in the in the 83 percent of vessels that we could analyze that the area under curve of FFRCT on a per uh, uh, vessel basis was 0.94, which was significantly higher than either with CT alone it's 0.83, with SPECT alone it's 0.7, or with PET alone it's 0.87. Um, so why is this important? Um, because the guidelines do not state what we should do in the current area, whether we should start with an anatomical test, where we start with a, with a functional test. It's very obscure, and I think this, uh, the combination of the two tests might, might help, uh, which with FFRCT is an example of combining anatomy with um, uh, the functional testing. Um, so um, previously, diagnostic performance FFRCT has only been compared with CT alone and not with the many utilized nuclear cardiology tests. And we did that for the first time. And now we see that FFRCT compares favorably if you get a good result uh, from the scan and your image quality um, is good. So basically supporting the fact that you can use FFRCT when you're in doubt about the hemodynamic consequences of lesions. You see it at a regular CT scan. So it's essential to remember um, that this is the first head-to-head -head comparison in a large cohort of patients without any bias of referral to a CAT lab with FFR uh, in each and every one of the cases. Um, FFR CT, once you get back a reading, it's very important to stress, if you get back a reading, then it displays the highest diagnostic accuracy as opposed to nuclear cardiology tests with PET and with SPECT or with CTCA alone. But it's also important to notice that the dropout rate is 70%. So we need to drive image quality to get that number up. Um, so um, I think FFR CT has come a long way from the first trials um, with the FACTO and uh, with the Discover Flow and then builds on the experience of uh, the NXT trial and now has a clear comparison to other tests uh, saying that it really adds to the clinical practice and we should probably um, head in to this direction of more routinely using FFR CT but again it should be driven by a company by driving image quality to the utmost level mm -hmm. to get to get good results back um, from uh, from heart flow. Well, that's great. Uh, it's a fascinating study. Congratulations. Um, so let me ask you a, a few questions. I mean, of the non-invasive tests, you clearly showed the highest AUC for FFRCT. Um, on the other hand, we can argue that FFRCT was tuned against C uh, FFR. 
invasive FFR. So this really gets to the question of what is the gold standard? Exactly. Is FFR the gold standard now for ischemia? And in this regard, I will say that another late-breaking trial that was presented today and was published in the New England Journal was the five-year results of the FAME-2 trial. And in 888 randomized patients with um, an FFR of less than 0.8, less than or equal to 0.8 by uh, invasive FFR, patients who underwent um, a PCI strategy as opposed to a, an optimal medical therapy strategy had lower rates of cardiac death or myocardial infarction at five years, and um, separately lower rates of myocardial infarction. So it's a pretty impressive study suggesting that we should be treating ischemic lesions. Um, while there are some who would argue about the importance of sham controls and other issues, I would say that these five-year data from FAME2 are, are pretty impressive and support invasive physiology with FFR. So is that, and I'd love to hear Patrick's uh, opinion too, is that the new gold standard and therefore is appropriate to um, compare to that? Some people might say PET is the gold standard for ischemia, for example. So what's your feeling? And then Patrick, what do you think? Well, um none of these measures, either FFRCT, PET, or SPEC, actually measures ischemia. Right. All what we do is measure flow, either a qua um, qualitative or quantitative, or a pressure uh, drop, a hyperemic pressure drop, which we can translate into flow, but none of this is, right. is ischemia. And that's important to mention. You were not doing um, uh, F18 deoxy PET. You weren't doing uh, glucose metabolism PET, you were doing PET that measures perfusion. flow, yeah. perfusion. With oxygen 15 labeled right. water, which exactly. is considered the gold standard. Right. Um, so, um, so it's very important that none of these tests uh, demonstrate ischemia. Um, so from the early days of the validation of FFR, we know that probably if we are going to talk about flow impairment then rather than ischemia, right. that probably the optimal threshold for fractional flow reserve is somewhere around between 0.65 and 0.75 right. or so, and in between that range. However, However, the FAME trials were conducted with 0.8 right. as, as threshold, not to you know, under-treat right. patients, if, if you will. So uh, is that the reference standard? Probably not, but it's the only standard we have with solid data of FAME 1 and FAME 2 with long-term outcome, stating that if we act according to FFR, we're going to treat the patients right in terms of improving outcome. Right. And this is basically the only reference standard that has done so. So when we discussed about um, initiating the Pacific trial, we had this discussion, you yeah. know, what, what is the reference standard? But the, the patient merely wants to know, am I going to go to the cat lab just or unjust? And am I going to get a stent just or unjust or bypass surgery right. just or unjust? And the reality is that in the current guidelines, it's a class 1A recommendation to do that FFR guided. So. Um, it is a flawed um, uh, reference standard, if you will, for ischemia, but it's, it, it is the best reference standard we have to, to, to drive revascularization. So all these non-invasive tests have now been tailored towards that epicenter of FFR with all its pros and cons. So we could talk about gold standards or reference standards for ischemia versus for prognosis. So Patrick, how do we establish what is the gold standard for a test when we then introduce a new modality to test against? Yeah, first, I mean, <clears throat> if you look at uh, 94, I mean, uh, the FFR was test against dobutamine stress, against thallium, against exercise right. testing. So they were historically the gold standard. Now, it took a long, long time to reverse that. Today, you look at the specificity and sensitivity versus the FFR. Uh, I think that, as usual, uh, you can make the diagnose, but at a certain point, as you said, it's the prognose which is going to be the issue. And prognose may mean long-term and outcome trial. So all this technology has to come in the outcome trial and long term. Mm -hmm. Now around the corner, and, and I think the art flow has been triggering the imagination of many people when you introduce these color-coded uh, angiography, you have, of course, uh, wake up the people who are working on coronary angiography. And I think that very soon you will see this debate QFR versus FFR, which is compatible because one is non-invasive and the other you have to be right. in the lab. So I think it's very important to make the difference between ischemia and flow and to make the, uh, the difference between diagnose, prognose and outcome. And I, I think we go in that direction. 
And you agree that the Fame 2 results are fairly it's, supportive. It's remarkable. Yeah. It's remarkable. And, you know, the scar is scar. I mean, it's not that, but you see that there was also a difference yeah. in mortality. Yeah, there was. There the other was. We're not showing the difference in mortality, yeah. but uh, scar has a difference in mortality. It yeah. has always and non randomized, and yeah, exactly. but much larger, on yeah, the other hand. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, congratulations. I think this was very important because, you know, again, you compared to multiple different modalities. So let's talk quickly um, uh, to this fact that 83% of the vessels were able to get an FFR CT. Um, how many had an adequate CT? Um, to at least that were eligible on camel. I'm going to come back to you for the difference between an eligible CT that you could at least read a CT and be comfortable in knowing the stenosis severity versus that supports an FFR CT. Yeah. So that's an interesting question because you know in CT grading it's not binary as with right. heart flow. I you know heart flow computer either come back plus so or you minus. Do it you or know. Not do it. Yeah. You you get a reading or you don't. And with CT coronary angiography, you obviously have poor image quality, intermediate, and high image quality, right. and it and it varies in between. So uh, I can't really answer that question, but there's great overlap between yeah. an uninterpreted, visually uh, uninterpretable CT right. and not getting a heart flow reading. Those are pretty much the same scans. So the 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 rejection rate in in terms of uh, CT coronary angiography was about one in ten, well, um, maybe a little bit higher. Um, uh, so so uh, uh, definitely. The, the number of, of rejects with FFR CT is, is somewhat higher than, than you would do with visual estimation of CTCA um, solo. Um, uh, but, but that being uh, uh, said, I think it's important that in the initial results um, we had an intention to diagnose and saying if you can't interpret the CT, we're going to label it positive because you don't want to miss any patients. And that's not taken up in these, in, in these results because this one's not an intention to di diagnose only when we got sure. back the CT reading. So I think this calls for a prospective trial after we've done this sub-analysis of the Pacific trial uh, to see you know, what if you do an intention to diagnose in a prospective manner and you take FFRCT into account and how does it compare uh, to other non-invasive imaging modalities. I think this sub-study of the Pacific you know, is, is a real good step forward uh, towards uh, such analysis because it shows such great promise. But we, ne we need to see what happens if you do it in a prospective manner and especially if you can reduce the rate of re rejection from 17 to a couple of so percent. Let me, so Campbell, let me, in that regard, let me ask you, so what are the specific modalities that should be done in the CT to get an optimal result sure. for analysis by FFRCT and, and do you see a training effect? I'd imagine you've got sites that are better at it than others and that are worse and sites probably get better over time as they learn how to do those specific setup. Sure. So Professor Knopf had said it exactly right, that in order to, what we hear from our people who use FFRCT from our customers is, if I can't read full anatomic definition throughout the coronaries as a reader, as a radiologist or a cardiologist, then heart flow is probably not going to be able to analyze right. this. And that they, they kind of go hand in hand. Right. We spend a lot of time and effort working with sites and, and making sure they understand we're gathering CT for quantitative purposes, different than you've perhaps right. been doing. And there are certain things to do. They don't involve additional you know, contrast or radiation. They right. involve attention to some of the uh, nuances of image acquisition. As we do that, the training comment is a really good one. Uh, it's very perceptive that we see much, much higher rates as places become familiar with what needs to be done. So as an example, to put a number on it, we presented data in Japan at the JCS meetings in March of a thousand patients in our global advance registry, where the acceptance rate across 13 sites in Japan was 97%. That's great. So it, it can be done at much, much higher levels, even with fairly complex disease, which is what the Japanese were enrolling. But it doesn't come by accident. It comes with really close attention to detail. And are, is the the major, are the major issues heart rate, patient motion, what are some of the other yeah, issues? Heart, heart rate is an, an overwhelming issue yeah. and uh, administration of nitrates, so we get yeah. good vasodilation, yep. uh, are by far the two biggest and then there are okay. some nuances of image acquisition and how the machine is actually set to right. acquire images. And now, so Paul, going back to your presentation, I think if I saw it right, and it's the first time I noticed it, you actually said there were slightly more false negatives than false positives. 
Is that correct with the FFRCT compared to invasive FFR? And you were saying that maybe heart flow was set up to be conservative. I think some other studies have maybe find slightly more false positives, false negatives. So maybe I'd come back to Campbell and say, what, what is the source of false positives and false negatives with FFRCT compared to FFR? Yeah, so for it, 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 it almost always comes down to the anatomic uh, fidelity of how we segment the coronary lumens derived from CT. There are, of course, nuances to FFR acquisition in the cath lab, and this study was done with unbelievable, you know, at a single center whose passion is measuring right. physiology in the cath lab. So there are other sites where the, you know, there may be more variants, and there have been publications on variants right. in measured FFR right. as well. So on our test is, it's nothing is perfect. Sure. It, there are false positives and false negatives. They are almost always derived, again, from our segmentation, and they tend to be relatively few when you think of them in the context, as in Pacific, of the other tests which are being sure. used today as non-invasive tests. And they're more in that intermediate range, too, right, around 0.8. Yeah, uh, so that's you really know. important right. to, to okay. highlight, so because, you know, a, a 0.81 is right. not exactly. uh, realistically much different from 0 0.79. 0 .79. Right. And, and there's not an interventionist in the world who will, you know, say, okay, exactly. you got 0 0.81, and you're never going to get a stand, and you got right. 0 0.79, and you're always going to get a stand. Well, there are some on Twitter. Yes. Right? Some, <laughs> of them, uh, some of them are like that. <laughs> but, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's a gradual de decline, and the cutoff value obviously yeah. comes from, from the fame trial. And we should, right. we should grossly adhere to it, but also feel, you know, that there's a patient, um, and and on, on the table, uh, it's 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 a complex disease, and and 0.78 is not necessarily the different point than 0.8. But if you, exactly. if you if you put but it it's out rare into numbers, that you're going to have point 0.9 and 0.6. Exactly, I mean, it's, it's exactly. Usually, but yeah. that rarely happens. Yeah. So so last point, and then I want to go on to syntax three. So describe the patients that this data applies to. Were these patients with a typical chest pain or moderate to high probability chest pain? Did they it's mostly have difference. single or mild coronary disease, the ones who actually had disease? What was the disease prevalence? So the inclusion criteria was that uh, patients uh, did not have a prior history of coronary artery disease, uh, so no MI, so no PCI, no, no bypass with a preserved LV function, ejection fraction above 50%, and who was deemed based on the updated diamond of force criteria to be in intermediate likelihood. Okay. And that's exactly what we got because the prevalence of disease on a per patient patient was 43%. Right. So that is intermediate risk. So we, we screened them well. However, when you take a look at what non-invasive testing is all about, prevalence of disease sure. is much lower. It's in, if you take a look at the PROMISE right. trial, it was below 10%. Right. So that's very important to realize that this this holds true for a prevalence of disease of 43%, which is intermediate, but the majority of patients we screen in daily practice is, is low to intermediate at best. Uh, so that's an issue that maybe, you know, we've been over-utilizing diagnostic uh, tools, yeah. but that's sort of a different discussion. And, and also relatively few patients with triple vessel and left main coronary disease. Well, you know, of, you of some. No, yeah, so, so of, the, of, of the 43 that, that had disease, right. there's, there's the relatively normal distribution of single sure. vessel and, sure. and, and dual vessel and triple vessel disease. Right. So About one in four got a revascularization procedure. Right. So now let's transition into the really complex patients, patients with triple vessel and left main disease, and hear about the Syntax-3 study. So um, what happens is that in the Syntax-2, which was the use of IFR in three vessel disease, we introduced a sub-study, and the goal was to compare the FFR-CT with the IFR. And we gained some experience with the three vessel disease, and we realized that, of course, you could use the technology to make a diagnose. There is disease, or there is no disease. You can say non obstructive disease. We went really for the three vessel disease and, uh, and uh, obstructive disease. And classically, uh, coronary angiography has been the uh, preferred diagnostic uh, modality. We have seen this tremendous progress. And I've watched that for many years now of uh, heart flow and the multi-slide CT scan. And then uh, we had always the legacy of the anatomic syntax score and the syntax score too. So we decided with this experience in syntax too to do a dedicated uh, a trial. And uh, uh, as I said, on, on top of the anatomical syntax score, we had this uh, patient characteristic age, sex, creatinine, ejection fraction, 
uh, peripheral disease and COPD who allow us to say that patient has to go to surgery or has to receive PCI or is equipoise. And it is based on the uh, mortality at, uh, at four years. And then we had the crazy idea, because it's a crazy idea, instead to randomize the patient, we said we are going to randomize the doctor and the imaging technique. So it's the same patient seen by two teams. One has the cine angiography, the other has the multi-slide uh, CT. And we will look uh, if they agree about the diagnose, the decision to go to surgery, the mode of revascularization, and also the uh, planning. And these are these are two different groups of physicians, right? Two, these aren't the same groups. physicians. Yeah, two different so, groups. So you've also got that variability yeah, and yeah, how that different variability. groups of physicians. I mean, it was a long discussion. Should we randomize that too, by the way? Right. Uh, <laughs> but we found in general three to four heart team per institution, okay. and they were playing around uh, in a in a non-randomized fashion. Mm. So you see we start with left main and three vessel disease, 223 patients, then you had the GE revolution, and then you have one patient which is go either to the, is seen by the heart team B, let's start by that, and the heart team B has only the multi-slide CT scan, he's going to define the anatomic syntax score, Combine that with the comorbidity and come to a syntax score two for decision making. And then the primary, the primary endpoint was the agreement with the same type of approach make on cine angiography. This guy has to do the same anatomic syntax score combined with the comorbidity to get the syntax score too. As you could see in the arm with the multi slide CT scan, there was a secondary endpoint what is the addition of the FFRCT, because now we have three things. Right. We have the anatomy, we have what we call the functional anatomy, and we have the comorbidity. And this is a virtual trial, so we were unblinding uh, everybody at the end. They were signed off uh, in between after the primary and the secondary endpoint, but we were unblinding. So, um, 223 patients, we were a little bit discussing the uh, quality. I mean, it was <coughs> remarkable. There's only one case who could not be analyzed in terms of anatomy, only one case. And if you look at FFRCT, 196 out of 223 could get the FFRCT. So we were reviewing the case uh, as a consultant for the, the physician. Mm -hmm. In the evening, we were sending the document to California, and the next morning we had the FFRCT to give to the physician as a complement. And as you see, uh, severe calcification only four Ks, motion artifact 18, and then some, some other things. Now this is very critical. It shows the anatomical syntax score. On the vertical axis, you have the multi-slice CT scan. On the horizontal axis, you have the uh, cine angiography. And you see there is a relationship which is not exceptional. I mean, the R square, the coefficient uh, R is uh, 0.59. By the way, we have done that in, in the past. And if you look at the blunt Altman, there is a bias for the anatomical score of about three. So in general, the multi-slice CT scan find a more severe anatomical score due to the calcium uh, mainly, which is seen much better. And then what we do is that we combine that with the uh, seven parameter, which is in the syntax score too. And today there was again the, the question many times, this is not juxtaposed, it's not here is the anatomy and here is the uh, clinical factors. It is all interaction. It's all based on interaction. So when you do that, uh, what you see is that you improve uh, considerably the relationship, so your syntax score by multi-slide CT scan or by cine angiography became very, very similar. Therefore, your decision of treatment become also very, very similar, and you get the agreement between the two heart team. And if you look at the blunt Hartman, uh, basically it's close to zero. I think it's 0.40, uh, not, not even one difference. And this time, the limit of agreement 
are uh, very close. And then is uh, the central uh, slide of the talk is uh, basically on the top you have the heart team treatment recommendation based on coronary computed tomography and on the left hand side you have the heart team treatment recommendation based on conventional angiography. And if you look at cabbage, they agree in 23.4% that this patient, this single patient, had to go to surgery. No other choice. And then in 69.4, they agree that it could be equipoise PCI cabbage or PCI. So altogether at the bottom you have an agreement of 93% between these two heart teams, which is quite remarkable. And this is for prediction of four-year mortality. It, it's based, it's based, based on four years two. mortality, but it is an agreement on right. which kind of right. treatment. And if you look strictly on, on the coins kappa, it's uh, 0 0.82. Uh, in, the, in the design paper, we were happy with 0 0.6, 0 0.8. 0.8 in the kappa jargon is almost perfect. It's not a casual term, it's the real statistical term. So we were very uh, happy with that. And there is a few more information. As you could see, uh, the heart team agree on the coronary segment to be revascularized in 81%, which is quite remarkable. Uh, the fractional flow could be done in the, in the large majority of the lesion, 869 versus uh, 1108. The mean FFRCT, we are in a severe population, is 0.63. And the FFRCT changed the treatment decision at the, at the patient level in 7%, but changed the, uh, uh, the anatomy in 36%. So there are vessels disappearing because we were systematically subtracting from the sure. anatomic syntactical the functional. So that happens quite frequently, but does not change per se the, the, decision. the decision for treatment. So that's basically uh, the news. Now, a few things that we learn is that, uh, um, and Campbell has been part of it, every Wednesday evening, we had always the same demonstration, starting by uh, uh, all the image, etc. And uh, months, weeks after weeks after weeks, we hear the surgeon saying, I don't need a coronary angiography. I see much more things. You know, they have, a, they have never been uh, exposed to multi-slice CT scan, certainly not to heart flow. For them, it was a discovery. And they see the landing zone. They, they see it's worse than the interventional cardiologist is red, and it's a good vessel. So I have to put my bypass there. So they are really uh, uh, committed to make a first in men in that field, uh, which will be really feasibility and safety. They will, be, they will have an escape hold if they don't want to operate only on the multi-slice CT scan. They can request the cine angiography. And we will look at the safety by doing a multi-slice CT scan one month later to be sure that I've put the bypass in the right place and that the, the bypass is open. So these were all patients with left main and triple vessel disease going in, Yeah. okay? Um, so we don't know for sure how it would apply to double vessel disease or less severe disease. And similarly, Paul, in your study, you had mostly patients with only 43 prevalence, 43 percent prevalence, and only about 10 percent or so with left main triple vessel disease. So I guess, are are these results applicable to less severe coronary disease? Are your results you know, applicable to more severe coronary disease? Greg, it's two different worlds. For the surgeon it's a major challenge to believe in a multi-slice CT scan and in FFRCT and saying I'm going to surgery without the cine angiography. Right. So it's really, that's the reason why you have to do a first in man before going further. For the interventional cardiologist, it's just a bonus. I spared the cat lab the day before. I got a lot of information about his bifurcation, this and that, and I go to the lab very well, very well, planning very well what I have to do. You can, you can even say, I'm going to do in LAO 37 degree and 47 because you know on the multi-slice CT scan that you see your LED lesion. So for us, it's a super bonus for the interventional cardiologist. Right. For the surgeon, it's a challenge. If we pass the challenge, then the whole world well, can well, start to work on it. Well, well, I agree with that entirely, because especially for us as interventionalists, 
you know, we're going to go to the cath lab. So, anyway. so, right. So if we have any questions based on what we saw from the FFRCT to we the cath lab, we can do invasive physiology. Yeah. But now for the surgeon, we're saying trust this and don't see the angiogram. And in that regard, it was interesting to me that there were 82% of vessels or so where you would have gotten a discrepant decision whether or not to revascularize. I think you described that as very good. Yeah. I might describe one in five vessels as we've got to really prove that it's okay to yeah. change your decision on those vessels. So what vessels were those? Were those, did they tend to be small, smaller coronary arteries? The, the small vessel was uh, one reason of uh, disagreement. You know, when you go below uh, 1.5 millimeter, 1.8 millimeter, they can have easily disagreement. Uh, surgeon keeps saying that they can put a bypass on a 1.5, but it doesn't happen every day. Uh, that was one reason of uh, disagreement. I think in general, if it works in this population, it will definitely work in the, in the, in the, in the, in the less severe disease. And actually, that's what, hap that's what happened now in daily practice, that after non-invasive imaging, um, specifically with CT, uh, with either combined with FFRCT, that you now refer patients to the cat lab, not for diagnostic angio, no, you, you, you refer them for, for getting a stent. So you could already do the informed consent. You, you have single vessel disease. We already know this from the non-invasive imaging. Um, uh, it's a type A lesion. Uh, we're gonna uh, load you with the, a double antiplatelet and you're gonna leave the cat lab with, with a right. stent, not with the diagnosis, because the diagnosis is already here. Right. So if this population lends itself for decision making right. in terms of revascularization, yeah. uh, it's o only easier downhill. So the last thing I'll say is that you know it was interesting that in, in your population, about seven percent of the patients, once they had the functional component added to the CT assessment, then got downgraded from cabbage to the either PCI or cabbage equipoise group. I think the FAME investigators have you know shown that in the past with invasive FFR, when you've got more of a, a double, triple vessel, multi-vessel disease population, that that can be even greater. It can be a third or so yeah, yeah. patients it, that it can get down. It is also the case, and we are talking here about the change in decision of treatment. Yeah. But what was uh, very uh, symptomatic is that from basically 92 percent, 94 percent of three vessel disease, because yeah. there was a few, a few pure main stem, a lot became. A turkey, turkey eight became right. three vessel disease for treatment. Right. So there's a lot uh, like in, in the syntax too, a lot of lesion would disappear. So Campbell, let me give you the, the last word. What do you think these two studies have added to the knowledge of what we know about uh, CT and FFRCT diagnosis and treatment um, guidelines of sure. disease? Yeah, well I think that as has been talked about, they provide incredibly compelling evidence. In the first case with Pacific, you can, and the, the discussion about gold standard was really interesting to hear. If one takes FFR because of the outcome data, including fame, and say that is a metric which clinicians today are looking for in terms of guiding revascularization strategy, that the FF, heart flow FFR CT analysis being held up against other tests which people are using today has the following strengths and weaknesses. So that's, that's point yeah. one. It's, it has clinical, a lot of clinical relevance, I think. Mm -hmm. And then second for the Syntax-3 trial is looking really broadly, and it's really profound to think about the impact yeah. from the perspective of cardiology as a whole of moving to a world where maybe invasive angiography is not necessary prior to, for example, bypass yeah. surgery. Like that's really revolutionary yeah. thinking, and there's a long way to go to, to go get away. to that stage. Yeah. But it, this is the first step, and it's provocative. Yeah. And I guess in closing also, I'll mention that, uh, you know, we're going to be embarking on pretty soon a 5,000 patient randomized trial called Decision, which is going to kind of integrate both of these concepts, where we're going to be taking moderate to high probability patients for coronary disease with unknown coronary status uh, who are destined for angiography. And the control group will um, undergo angiography and then invasive uh, physiology guided treatment decisions if there is disease. The treatment group will undergo um, FFRCT assessment, first a CT, and then again, if disease is present, then an FFRCT, and then either be deferred and not go to the cath lab at all. We expect that to probably be 60% or 65% of the patients. And then if they do have disease, the heart team will sit down ahead of time and will make their own determination of PCI versus cabbage, what they do anticipate ahead of time. 
um, and we'll be using a new, pool, a new tool that HeartFlow is developing called the PCI Planner, which, as you were mentioning, allows you to see all three coronaries, it allows you to see the FFR at every point, and it allows you to virtually subtract by putting in a virtual stent at any location you want to see how you might treat that patient. And it's going to give you assessment of diameter stenosis, lesion lengths, show you the optimal views, as you were mentioning, for projection, so it should save contrast, uh, radiation, etc. So then we'll go to the cath lab. Uh, we will be, we're not going to be doing the CT only, but we'll go to the cath lab. Uh, um, the goal will be not to do invasive physiology, but if there are some borderline situations where you want to do it to confirm something, then we'll do it. And this is an outcomes trial, so then we'll treat those patients, um, either PCI or cabbage, and follow the two different groups for uh, multiple years. So we're excited about that. I think uh, it's really a step forward to be able to have this both anatomic and physiologic data um, in the light of day, when a relaxed scenario where the referring cardiologist and internist, interventional cardiologist, Cardiologist, um, surgeon, and the patient can look at their data, review all their options to have that knowledge being forearmed. And we're getting the data to recommend that this is going to be the path forward in the future. I think Professor Serrano and I would like to sign up for the decision trial. Okay, <laughs> okay. I, we, we'd love to have you. Hopefully not as patients, though. So I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Patrick, uh, Paul, and Campbell. I think this was a great discussion. We probably went a little bit over time-wise, but there's so much to discuss. Uh, fantastic, and we'll look forward to seeing what this field holds in the future. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. Much. Thank you. Thank you.